Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I mic'd up. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about an um, uh, open source project I've been working on for the past six months called Dataset. Um, and this project was very much inspired by my experiences with um, Zite, and particularly Zite Now and the Zite API. So I absolutely love Zite Now. It's like the team at Zite looked deep into my soul and figured out exactly what I wanted from a hosting experience and then built just, just exactly those bits that I was interested in. It's fantastic. I use it for all sorts of things. I'm spraying out little side projects left, right, and center on it. Um, but of course, there's one massive limitation, which is that you don't get a database. And I. In a former career, I co-created Django, so I've got a lot of database-backed web, web app experience. So you'd have thought this would be a pretty big limitation. And then I was thinking about this one day, and I realized that it's not that, um, Zite, that, that now doesn't let you have a database. It just doesn't let you write to your database. Read-only databases are totally something that you can do. So why would you want a read-only database? What possible use could you have for something where you can't write data to it? Well, let's look at a quick example. Um, San Francisco is, uh, the, the city of San Francisco has got really keen on the whole open data movement. So they have a data portal. This is Data SF, and if you search it for, say, trees, you'll find one of my favorite CSV files on the internet. They have a CSV file with 190,000 trees in it. And for each tree, they've got the plant date and the species and the address and the latitude and longitude of where it is. This is a really cool CSV file. So what can we do with this? Well, this is where SQLite comes in. Um, Everyone here has used SQLite, the database, even if you don't know it. My watch has SQLite embedded in it and uses it to count steps. It's in mobile apps. It's, it's all over the place. It is a phenomenally powerful, extremely fast, lightweight, um, embedded database. And it turns out it's ideal for, work, for, for using with, with projects on Zite now. Um, each database, each SQLite database is a single file, so you can email them around and share them and upload them places. It's insanely fast. Um, it lets you open databases in immutable mode, so you can open a file and say, I'm not going to be making any writes to this, at which point it disables thread locking and all sorts of stuff and goes even faster. And this means that you can bundle up data and deploy it as part of your app to, to Zite. Like, literally, any time your data changes, just deploy a new copy. Why, why not? So I built another tool. I built a tool called CSVs to SQLite, which is a little command line tool, and it can take any CSV file, and it turns it into a SQLite database. So let's download this beautiful CSV file full of trees and turn it into trees.db, a nice binary blob that we can, which I think weighs in at about 50 megabytes that we can upload to Zite and, and, and copy around and so on. And then the other project I built was this thing called Dataset, which is a web app, it's a, it's a command line tool that you can run that will start a web server against one or more SQLite databases and give you an interface for browsing them, but also give you a JSON API for making queries. So we'll run it. If I run dataset trees.db on my brand new database full of trees, I get this. This is a unsurprising HTML table. You can order things by columns. You can start exploring the data that way. But you'll notice up there, there is a little this data as JSON link. And if you click on that, you get JSON. So now we've got every tree in San Francisco, all 190,000 of them, as a whole bunch of JSON. And because it's a database under the hood, we can use SQL to query it. So here's a SQL query. And any data set instance has a text area that you can type SQL into. Because it's in read-only mode, it's not like anyone can cause any damage to it. So select star from tree list where the species is the swamp myrtle and the care assistant is Friends of the Urban Forest, a San Francisco organization that looks after a lot of trees. But now let's build something. Let, so that's all running on my laptop. Next step, well, next obvious step is let's put this thing on the internet. And Dataset has a subcommand called Dataset Publish. And you can type dataset publish now. It also supports Heroku, and I'm going to add other hosting providers in the future. Dataset publish now, trees.db, and it churns away for a few seconds. And now we've got a URL for our trees. So this is live on the internet, 190,000 trees, ready for us to build something against. Um, and you can, you're welcome to pop, on, pop online and start playing with this right now. Here's a slightly more interesting SQL query. Um, it turns out SQLite has really good built-in full-text search. And if you set it up, you can do queries like this one, where I'm selecting the latitude and the longitude. I'm joining against the species table. I'm saying I want it where, in a subselect, the street tree list full-text search matches colon search. Colon search is how you do named parameters in SQLite. 
The data set will spot those and will make you a form field. So if you go to this page of that query and it'll notice that there's a, a named parameter, it'll give you a search field, you can type in cherry, and now we're seeing all of the cherry trees in San Francisco. And we can put them on a map. This is sf-trees.com. This is my personal search engine for trees in San Francisco. It turns out I didn't know this was the thing that I always wanted to build, but it, it really was. Um, <laughs> And if you view source on this, you'll see that there's almost no code to it. It's like a fetch call against the data set thing. It runs the SQL query, gets back results, and feeds them into the leaflet marker cluster library, which, which draws us a map. So that's super fun. So what else can we build with this? Well, the world is full, it turns out, of interesting CSV files that are just waiting to be liberated and turned into a, a more useful format. Um, but you can also use this to build, um, you can also use this toolkit to build much more useful um, sort of functional APIs. So the example here is an API for looking up time zones. Everywhere on Earth is part of a time zone. It's often useful to be able to say, OK, given this latitude and longitude, what time zone is that place in? Because then I can tell what the local time is and, and make calculations based on that. Um, but time zones are kind of complicated shapes. There's, there's, there's about 400 of them as well. Turns out that um, OpenStreetMap has all of these time zones as polygons. There's a uh, project on GitHub which extracts just the time zone shapes um, and turns them into this open standard called a shape file. And SQLite has an extension called SpatialLite that knows how to handle shape files. So you can combine all of these bits and pieces together and build a, build a data set instance full of time zones. Here it is. Um, so if I do select as GeoJSON, that's a function from SpatialLite, on the geometry column, I get back GeoJSON. And GeoJSON is a standard format that libraries like Leaflet know how to render. So this instant here, timezones-api.now.sh, actually has a custom template on each page that knows how to run that SQL query and draw the shape of the time zone. And again, almost nothing to this JavaScript. You can see I'm doing a fetch against slash timezones.json. I'm passing it the SQL query that pulls out that, that data. I'm sending it off to leaflet's geojson method, and that's the whole thing. Like, a dozen lines of JavaScript gets us a map of that time zone. Um, but this is where it gets really fun. Because Spatialite knows how to do spatial indexing, it can do fast point in polygon lookups. So I can say, select time zone from time zone IDs where the geom from text latitude, longitude is within that geometry shape. And again, named parameters, so I get form fields for longitude and latitude, and it gives me the time zone ID in 88 milliseconds, I think, which is pretty good, right? So we've gone from, so we, we now have a hosted API, which anyone is welcome to, to start playing with, that can give me the time zone of any point on Earth using a cup under the hood using, using some very efficient SQL queries against this embedded database. There are a bunch of other clever tricks in there. Um, dataset gives your SQL queries one second to execute and then terminates them, so you can't have somebody maliciously send expensive SQL queries and lock up your server. Um, it does some really neat things with foreign keys, so the, that web interface will have hyperlinks between different records if it detects a foreign key. Um, the URLs uh, all contain a six-digit hash of the content of the database, which means that if the data changes, the URL changes, which means you can cache things forever. So all of the, um, out of the box, all of the caching headers are set to far future, and if you put it behind something like Cloudflare, you just get, the one, a query will only, only ever be executed once, and will then be cached from, from then on. And we do some quite, um, quite efficient tricks with pagination to mean that you can page through 190,000 trees without it being too difficult. So that's the core of data set. Um, the next, the, the a feature I added just a couple of weeks ago is the ability to write plugins for this, because this tool on itself, the tool on its own is pretty fun, but what I really want is to build an ecosystem of additional tools around it that help with things like data visualization and, and adding extra features. And to illustrate plugins, I'll show you another one of my favorite CSV files. This is the USGS's Alaska Science Center, and back in 2009, they put ear tags on a whole bunch of polar bears in Alaska with like GPS trackers in, and they tracked the polar bears for a couple of years, and then they released the data as a CSV file. So you can obviously see where this is going. Here is a data set instance with, their, with all of their polar bears in it. There's 39,000 um, rows, each one recording the latitude and longitude of the polar bear and the battery voltage, just in case you're interested, and also the outdoor temperature. So the first plugin I built for dataset is called a dataset cluster map, and it was essentially extracted from the tree thing I showed you earlier. And if you have that plugin installed, 
It, every time you load a page, it looks and sees if there's a latitude and longitude column, and if there is, it puts them on a map. It's a map of polar bears. Again, I didn't know this was the thing I most wanted to create, but it turns out it was. Um, so that's all good, and that, that's all well and good. And this, this is a very, um, if you know how to use the command line and install Python packages and stuff, you can get a lot of stuff done with this. But my key market for data set is actually data journalists. Um, in a previous, um, previous job, I worked at the Guardian newspaper in London doing data journalism, you know, working on um, collecting data and analyzing it and using that to help inform stories. And it's a fascinating area to get, to get involved with. And those journalists collect a lot of data, but they don't really have a good mechanism for publishing that. At The Guardian, we ended up sticking it in Google Sheets and posting it on a blog because we wanted people to be able to, to further work with the data that we'd collected. I don't, want my my I don't want data journalists to have to install software. So I turned to the Zite API, um, in particular the OAuth-enabled API that they, they launched a while ago, and I built a tool called Dataset Publish. And Dataset Publish is a web app that deploys other web apps. It's a web app that you can upload CSV files to, click a button, and they will be deployed to Zite now under your own account. So the Zite API, it's all documented online. Um, here's what Dataset Publish looks like. It's not pretty, but it totally works. You click Get Started. Um, you OAuth with Zite. You grant access. And then you can upload a CSV file. In this case, I've got a file full of parking meters that I found. Um, again, on the San Francisco open data thing. So upload a CSV full of parking meters, fill out some optional metadata, click the button, churn, 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 and now we have that CSV file as a data set instance online and ready for people to start exploring, but also with a JSON API that people can start hooking into as well. And so I'm, I do a lot of side projects, and I've learned from painful experience in the past that the problem with side projects is the moment you have user accounts and people start using them, it's not so much a side, it's not a hobby anymore, it's actually something where you're on the hook if it breaks. Dataset Publish is the absolute best kind of side project because it doesn't deploy to my account. I don't see any of this data. It deploys to the user's Zite account instead. So I don't see the data, I don't store the data, I'm not responsible for the data. If the tool goes offline, the stuff people have already deployed through it keeps on working. It's already deployed to their account. So, so I can go on holiday without worrying that it's going to break and destroy people's um, pe stuff that people depend on. Um, I don't even store OAuth tokens. The, the Zite API gives me a token. I keep that in local storage in the browser because I don't want that stuff in a, in a database that I care about because then I have to worry about whether or not it gets leaked in a, in a hack later on. And not having a database is, again, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to build stuff without having to worry about that persistent storage. So that's data set, and that's data set publish. But I wanted to finish up with something far more useful than that. Um, and that's a website that I built with my wife a few weeks ago um, called Owls Near Me. And owlsnearme.com, which you should totally check out, is a website that tells you where your nearest owl is. The way it works, there's this amazing project called iNaturalist where people upload their observations of things. They've got a really good API. So we tap into the API, and we say, oh, you, you can click the button, it GPS locates you and says, here are the owls that people have seen near San Francisco. Here's a heat map showing you where, you can, where, where the owls are most likely to show up. Recent observations. It is a, it is a wonderful thing. It is the website I'm most proud of, I think. Um, there's just one problem. This is about owls, but what if you like other creatures? Well, my wife likes bats, so we bought batsnearme.com, and this is a website that shows you where bats are. And then we realized that this was probably going to get quite expensive. So, I am, this is a launch announcement. I am launching this on stage right now. Make-near-me.now.sh is a web app that lets you build your own version of Owls Near Me for your favorite species. So I'm going to click Sign In with Zite. I'm going to grant access. Does anyone have an uh, animal they want, to, they want to do this for? Foxes. OK, let's do that. So European foxes, true foxes. Ooh, what's a true fox? Um, let's do true foxes. Um, true foxes near me is suggesting, let's just do foxes near me. You hit the button, and dot, 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 live demos, super risk. There we go. Foxes near me, dot, now, dot, sh, is now a website. And if we click use my location, it's going to show me some foxes. Show me some foxes. Show me some foxes. Go on. Yes, foxes. <laughs> Hooray. So. The source code for this is available. If you want to get started with the Zite API, feel free to have a poke around. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <clears throat>